It is the afternoon of February 13, 2007. My name is Don Linke. This is another in the series of interviews for the Brendan D. Byrne Archive Project of the Rutgers Program on the Governor. Uh, this afternoon we'll be continuing uh, an interview with Raymond H. Bateman, uh, former Senate President and Republican candidate for Governor in the 1977 election. Uh, on the burn years and perspective on New Jersey government and politics uh, since the 1960s and 70s. Ray, uh, let's uh, clear up a few things from the 1977 campaign before we move on. Uh, one of the uh, political steps that the Democrats took in passing the income tax package was to make it expire. Uh, include a sunset provision that said the tax would have to be reenacted, I believe in 1977 or 78, uh, but sort of forcing the legislature to deal with the tax issue again shortly after the election. Did that tie your hands a little bit politically in the 1977 campaign, knowing that, there, that if you were elected... You'd have to do it again. You'd have to do it again. No. No, that was that was not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> that was other people's problems, but uh, not mine. But you didn't think that that was something that was sort of pressuring you to come up with a tax alternative no, no, package? No, 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 it didn't. If you had been elected, do you think you would have gotten through four years without the need for resorting to some broad-based tax? If I had increased the sales tax uh, uh, quickly, uh, if I had done away with the homestead rebates, I could have gotten through four years. But, uh, you know, who knows? If you're governor, you're, you're looking at 80, eight years, really, not four. Could I have gotten through eight years? No way. Now, I know it's, it's totally speculation, but do you think that a non-income tax fiscal program would have satisfied the Supreme Court? <coughs> <coughs> I'm not sure what would have satisfied the Supreme Court. As, as you know, I, I was uh, very upset with the Supreme Court decisions. I thought they were bad decisions uh, based on a lack of knowledge, really, uh, more than anything else. Uh, I mean, they were trying to do the right thing, but they didn't know what the right thing was. Uh, uh, I, don't think, I don't think it mattered to the Supreme Court which tax you raise? Uh, they wanted uh, uh, they wanted certain things to happen with the spending of the tax, not not the tax. I don't think it, I don't think it would have it would have mattered. But uh, inevitably, now this is a period of time. Inevitably, you were going to have an income tax in New Jersey as well as a sales tax. Uh, it's just a, uh, just a question of when and how and why. Now we talked a little bit about some of the political maneuvering, such as the homestead rebate checks, which you described as sort of critical, I think, to the re-election of Brendan no, Burns. No question. Uh, and I just mentioned the uh, sunset provision. Were there any things in the 1977 campaign that you felt were unfair in terms of steps the Democrats or the Byrne campaign took? I think, uh, you know, <clears throat> unfairness is uh, is in the eye of of uh, the people around you more than yourself uh, and uh, the people around me saw what they thought were a lot of little unfairnesses but I know you know that, that's campaigning you know, can, campaigning isn't isn't uh, uh, you know, your fair game and uh, what they do is uh, and what I do uh, is uh, uh, is kind of gamesmanship that's part of campaigning. I wouldn't. I, I had run campaigns, as you know, and uh, I had seen some buttes. Uh, uh, Cliff Cases' camp, first campaign against Charlie Howell, uh, talk about unfairnesses. There were some beautiful unfairnesses that were done on both sides, and I was helping to run that campaign. So you feel in 1977, except for. <laughs> I, Some little problems. It was generally an up and up campaign yeah, on both yeah, sides. Absolutely, and it, it had to be because we were together so much. You know, if it had been, if there had been real unfairnesses, uh, 
he'd have talked to me about it or I would have talked to him about it. That you had such a personal yeah, relationship yeah, we, we that you a, would have put your cards on the table oh, yeah, and said, abs I, I don't think this is right, or, or he would have said the same to you. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk generally about uh, campaigns and politics in New Jersey since 1977. Obviously, one of the major differences is that money has become so critical uh, despite the innovations in New Jersey on public financing of gubernatorial campaigns. Uh, is there any way to sort of deal with this problem, or is it so constitutionally embedded given the Supreme Court decisions and so yeah. forth that there's yeah. nothing you can the do? The only about? way you deal with it is to change the Supreme Court decision so that a, so that a billionaire can't buy an election. <clears throat> Other than that, uh, uh, the, the, the money problem, you know, raising money, uh, raising money is a test of a good candidate. Uh, a good candidate can raise money, and that's part of his being or her being a good candidate. The, uh, uh, but uh, uh, where that gets, comes afoul of, of uh, where, where the system gets screwed up is when uh, a, a multi- wealthy guy can buy an election and that that is so fundamentally wrong i don't see uh, how we we change that excuse me except uh through the supreme court and obviously we've recently seen governor corzine on the gubernatorial level and the senate Bloomberg, level corzine uh, uh and, and and some others and uh uh it just it, it just it just totally runs over top of what the American political system should be all about. You know, we take a guy like Bobby Franks, who was a good congressman, much better congressman than he was a, a, a legislator, as a matter of fact, he was a good congressman. And uh, he raised 10 or 12 million dollars, he got blown away. Well, he, he lost by a couple of points, but uh, when a guy spends 65 million dollars of his own money to beat you, uh, that's a transgression on the American political system. Uh, that, that really offends the hell out of me. Ray, you made a strong reputation on education issues, both K-12 and higher education. I wanted to, again, take you back uh, with the benefit of hindsight, and let's look at uh, the K-12 problem, which was so critical in that 1977 campaign as to how to finance uh, urban schools. Uh, what's gone wrong <laughs> since 1977 in terms of confronting the school finance issue and the performance of schools, uh, particularly in the cities? Uh, yeah, you know what I think went wrong? There aren't enough people in the legislative process, Democrat and Republican, who are, who, who are really, really uh, dedicated to trying to make uh, the right thing happen. You know, there's there, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of good guys and and, 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 and good gals who have worked on the problem. But generally speaking, uh, uh, there isn't there there isn't the dedication that I think there should be to public education and to higher education. I mean, you know, I'm I'm today I'm offended by uh, uh, the fact that uh, our new governor uh, singles out higher education for the biggest cuts. That he made in the budget in the first budget, you know, to, to me that was, to me that was offensive, but uh, you know that's just my perspective. But my perspective is there weren't any people out there fighting for it, not even the educators. They're all, you know, all the the, the educators tend to say, oh, I want to be in good with the governor, so I won't fight him, uh, and they ought to fight for their for their for their rights. Staying on the K twelve um, yeah. topic for a second. Um, and we spoke about this a bit in the first session, but would different approaches have had maybe better results in terms of confronting the school issue uh, apart from the spending focus, uh, looking at countywide well, districts? As you, as you know, I had uh, uh, the, the sum and substance of our school aid study commission, uh, I thought was in focus. and. You you know it's it's easy to it's easy to in hindsight to talk about it, but it was very difficult to get urban educational uh, 
uh, initiatives through a Republican legislature. You know, that, that, that's, not, that's not where they come from. Yeah. And uh, uh, so we weren't as, as successful as we should have been. As I told you, the, one of the things, that, one of the real great mistakes that I made was, was not to uh, prevent cities from using the education funds for, for tax relief. You know, that, uh, that, that really was a mistake. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'll take credit for that, or our commission can take credit for that, uh, or, or blame. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, I think there's been too much focus on, on, on the dollars and not enough focus on what you do with the dollars. Would it also have been politically impossible to sort of force countywide districts or a more regional approach? It would have been back then. Because of race? Yeah, yeah. Because, of, uh, because of the powerful uh, uh, local home rule uh, uh, that, was, that was so evident in, in the 70s and 60s. I think today you can do more things along those lines. Well, Governor Corzine has sort of pulled back from some earlier proposals to make these county uh, school superintendents more powerful than what appears to be the case in the legislation now working its way through the legislature. Yeah. But do you see a, a, a county-wide approach as a more well, I always thought, more I, always thought I always thought that was, the, that was the right way to go, uh, <clears throat> as difficult as it is. But people understand counties. Uh, people are very, you know, and politicians are very county-based, county-oriented. Uh, so I always thought that was the least lousy solution, uh, uh, that it could have happened, but it didn't. Any other sort of ideas that you would have liked to have seen enacted either then or now in terms of K-12 education? Yeah, the uh, uh, providing money for programs. Uh, if your school district puts in a good physics program that you don't have, uh, you should, you, that, that's a way to get uh, better educational performance for kids uh, out of the system. And I always thought that was, uh, that was reasonable, doable, uh, but very hard to explain. Let's move to higher education. You again have taken a leadership role in creating in New Jersey a much more comprehensive higher education educational system than what existed when you started out in public life. I'll talk a little bit about those early days in terms of your role and the roles of others in creating the higher educational system. Well, the, 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 the biggest jump I got into the system was when I <coughs> joined Al Beadleston and uh, Cliff Barkalo in uh, sponsoring the uh, county college law. We had no county colleges, and this was 63 or 64, 63, I think. And uh, uh, I got lucky because the uh, uh, assistant commissioner of education, Joe Clayton, was a guy from the shore that everybody respected, and this was kind of his baby, and he uh, he made sure we were involved in it, and uh, you know when you look back, that was uh, that was uh, 40 years ago, and see so you got 19 county colleges with huge uh, uh, 350,000 kids in them, and and good facilities, and uh, 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 pretty damn well run for the most part. I mean, a couple of them that have its, their problems because they're too small, but. Uh, uh, generally speaking, the county colleges are, uh, are uh, a credit, a big, handsome credit to New Jersey. And I, you know, I, uh, uh, because nobody knows any better, and I'm the only one alive that was a sponsor. They call me the father of it. I wasn't, uh, but I was involved with with uh, two or three other guys. And of course, you've had a significant role with one particular. Yeah, and I've been the chairman of a college for 25 years in the Somerset and Raritan Valley now. And that was a great experience for me. It really was. In terms of learning the sort of nuts and bolts of how you run yeah, colleges? And, and in terms of learning how important uh, a, a community college is to young people. They don't know where they're going. 
they had a lousy experience in high school uh, for, for whatever reason, they come and they find themselves. And, and you know, two years in a good community college and they're off to, they're off to the best four-year colleges around uh, uh, and, do, and do very well, a lot of them. A lot of them find their way into uh, the job market through the, I mean, I think, they're, I think they're, they're the best thing that's happened to public higher education in New Jersey. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, uh, you know, we've been involved in the growth of, of uh, our state colleges, which were really very small kind of teacher's college operations when I got involved. And uh, they've been grown uh, big time. Uh, you know, you look at Montclair, for example, that's a university. Uh, and uh, Brookdale is pretty close behind. You know, there's some fine, fine. Uh, oh, Brookdale wasn't a four-year college. Uh, uh, but uh, college in New Jersey is a beautiful college. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know academically and every other way. Uh, uh, we've done well in our in our state colleges. Our university has grown big time. Uh, so you know, over those years in the '60s and the '70s, especially, we pumped a hell of a lot of money into into the system. And I got a kick out of uh, you know uh, I helped Mason Gross when he wanted to establish Livingston College and uh, when he was trying to get a medical school program and you know I, I, I uh, you know there are little things you can do in the legislature that, that, that are important. Well since we're on the campus of Rutgers uh, what are your memories or personal anecdotes about some of the past Rutgers figures that you dealt with like Mason Gross, Ed Blaustein and others? Mason Gross, uh, Mason Gross was a guy who, at the time in the '60s, recognized uh, what the riots meant to New Jersey and what he could do educationally and try to help. He was, he was, he was a. He was a uh, some people said he was a stiff, but he was a pretty smart stiff. And uh, uh, then Eddie Blaustein came along, and Eddie. And Eddie was a, was was quite political and quite good at it, and raised money. And and uh, I'm sorry, you know, when he died, it was a it was a real shame because he was he was uh, he he had become a powerful force. I always felt that the president of Rutgers was uh, at least the second most important public official in New Jersey, uh, uh, <clears throat> maybe even the most important public official in New Jersey when you think about it. Uh, and after that, uh, 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 it got a little shaky with Fran Lawrence. Uh, uh, he was he was a uh, he wasn't an upfront presidential type. He was he, he was a conscientious president, but he wasn't a guy that was going to uh, look the governor in the eye and uh, uh, make something happen. I think Fran Lawrence is getting that way. Yeah. I think he's he's improving. Going back to politics uh, for just one question, uh, Governor Byrne has said that he felt when Ed Blaustein was quoted during the 1977 campaign as saying that it would not make any difference to Rutgers whether he or you were elected, that that was, and I may be not using the accurate word, but dishonest of Blaustein because he felt that Rutgers would be significantly impacted by the lack of a broad-based tax like the income tax. Do you recall any discussions about that? Uh, uh, not really. Uh, we didn't relate the broad-based tax to, to Rutgers uh, uh, as much as that sounds. Uh, I think I'd have done more for Rutgers than Brendan because I, you know, I, I was involved. You know, I was a, you know, I was in the middle of every Rutgers project, even when <laughs> when Bill Cahill had a bond issue, uh, a higher education bond issue in '71. He calls us all in and said, "Here it is. It's what ninety ninety five million dollars. This is it. You know, I, I just want your approval." And I said, "No." Well, given and he said, "Why?" And I said, "There's no gym for Rutgers." <laughs> So we put in, he said, how much do you want? And we put in money. But, you know, I, so I was involved in everything that, 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 that uh, was, and I, and, I, and I got a kick out of it. 
Well, given your personal history in supporting Rutgers and possibly your personal relationship with Ed Blaustein over the various legislative uh, measures that were in the, you know, in the legislature while you were a leader, uh, do you think he may have leaned over a little bit backwards toward your candidacy over Brendan's in terms uh, you of know, his public uh, hey, statement? <clears throat> First of all, a Rutgers president should not get involved in a gubernatorial election campaign, and especially that one, because uh, uh, either either with Brendan or with me, uh, uh, Rutgers was was going to do okay. Uh, so you know, it, it's it's bad policy for a, a Rutgers president to even infer that uh, that Bateman's better than Byrne or Byrne's better than Bateman. Uh, really, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, but Eddie was a guy who, who was, you know, Eddie and I were close. Uh, we, we used to, he used to come to, to uh, budget hearings, uh, and when we were putting the budget together in the last couple of nights, he'd be there. And he and, he and uh, uh, Bowie Schwartz and Jim Hackett and I used to play bridge in the Senate uh, till four or five in the morning waiting for, every, for all the, the, the dominoes to fall. Uh, Eddie was, uh, uh, Eddie knew what he was doing. Uh, uh, he and I had gone to a bunch of Eagleton seminars that Don Hertzberg ran, uh, that the Carnegie Foundation funded, and then we got pretty close. And so, if he made a slip or two, it was because uh, uh, he wanted to. <laughs> I guess. Uh, we've also heard a few stories in this series of interviews about tensions between. Rutgers presidents, particularly Ed Blaustein and the Chancellor of Higher Education oh, yeah. in Trent. That was for real. Any anecdotes or memories of those? I don't have any real anecdotes, but I was, you know, you, you had to be aware uh, that Ralph Dungan and, uh, and uh, Eddie Blaustein were on uh, collision courses. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it, uh, the nature of their, of their responsibilities made it so. Uh, you know, uh, Eddie thought he ran the state university, and he wasn't about to be run by uh, the chancellor. And so that you know, there's a natural there's a natural collision between those two uh, points. Well, in subsequent years, uh, Governor Whitman deregulated yes, higher education, uh, abolishing the Department of Higher Education and the position of chancellor giving the state colleges and the county colleges uh, much more autonomy. Was this a good or a bad move? At the time, it was probably a good move. I, you know, it, uh, I'm not sure today what I'd say. Uh, but it, what it did was it gave the county colleges more autonomy. Uh, the, the state colleges, and this was part of, uh, I think this was part of the rub with Blaustein, the state colleges were kind of close to Dungan. They got more out of Dungan than the county colleges did and or the university uh, in a variety of ways. And I think, uh, I think it nettled them. Uh, I suspect I would have done what Christie did. Uh, I don't know what I would do today. Today it's different. There's been some criticism that the lack of an advocate for higher education within the governor's cabinet has hurt the higher education community in general. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I think that uh, I think that that's one of the reasons why a chancellor uh, might be important to the to to the whole uh, system. And the other is is uh, has to do with coordination between the various units. Uh, they, they they tend to. Uh, there, there's, there's been a new trend. It actually started with Christie, because I was involved in it, uh, uh, for the university to seek out uh, uh, second year, third year students from the county colleges and, and set up a system that they, can, they could feed them through. Uh, but a chancellor, a good chancellor would have implemented some of that stuff earlier, I suspect. And uh, uh, there are lots of ways to to integrate uh, the university, the state colleges, and the county colleges uh, through its here. So I, you know, I, I'm, I'm much more pro-chancellor at this moment than I was when Christie came through. 
another issue that uh, we're revisiting is the potential consolidation of Rutgers with New Jersey Institute of Technology and the medical school UMDNJ. How do you feel about that? I think it's, uh, it depends how you do it, but uh, I'm concerned with the sheer weight of size. You know, it's hard as hell to run a university of 50,000 people in five different places. To include the University of Medicine and Dentistry, which is a tough, which is a tough component no matter who, who does it, uh, NJIT, uh, and, and I guess some of the talk is that you set up a Newark University with those components. Uh, uh, that would be that would be somewhat more interesting to me than having the whole thing under one uh, under you know I just don't think you see how you could do it. I think it's hard enough now for a president to to run a fifty thousand student university. In other words, the uh, the sheer size of what they're talking about scares me. Uh, another current issue that's in the newspapers is the scandal at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey and it, particularly its involvement in the political system in Trenton. Uh, how did this come about? Is this just a sort of product of the times? No, it came about uh, It really uh, uh, it really started after Kane. Uh, uh, who was the governor after Kane? Jim Florio. <laughs> Jim Florio and Christy Whitman packed that place. And it became a, it, it, that's where they dumped their assistant treasurers and anybody that, uh, uh, anybody that they, they wanted to get rid of, they put them over there. It became a real, uh, a, a real nest, and I I I, I kind of blame Florio and Whitman uh, for abusing that one. And I don't. And it may have started with Kane, but I don't have any re recollection that it did. Of course, one of the political decisions that I think goes back to your time in the legislature was the idea that. Whenever anything happened in North Jersey, like with the medical school, South Jersey had to sort of get its uh, also equivalent share. Is this something just is natural to New Jersey politics that South Jersey has to, uh, I don't want to say get paid off, but to get something when, when, when some major project or program uh, positively impacts North there Jersey? There was always that, there was always that, that uh, feeling in the, especially in the legislature, uh, it didn't, it didn't, uh, uh, it didn't develop that much for South Jersey when I was there, but subsequently, uh, the South Jersey voices have been loud, clear, and important. Uh, starting with the casinos, I guess, uh, uh, and from then on, the decisions, uh, whether it was for Camden or the. Uh, the Atlantic City Expressway or the casinos or a train to Atlantic City or a convention center, a uh, new convention center or a highway. And those things became quite important. Now that you mentioned once again casinos, so looking back, uh, Atlantic City been success, failure, somewhere in between? Somewhere in between. I never thought that uh, I never thought that uh, the guys that really ran the casino businesses uh, paid enough ten attention to Atlantic City itself. Uh, uh, and I always thought that they, because they had very good representation, you know, their senator was the strongest member of the Senate. And, and when Gormley said, uh, uh, you know, you don't do this, you don't do that, uh, that's what usually happened. So they had the best, they had the most effective Senator in the process, and, and uh, he uh, uh, he ran he ran all over everybody. You know, he was good. Governor Byrne has said that one of the mistakes he feels the administration made, and possibly the legislature, was 
failing to establish some regional agency like the Meadowlands Commission over Atlantic City and its region when the casino referendums were proposed and approved in the legislature. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's legitimate. <clears throat> but they would had none of that. You know, they, uh, they, were, they yeah. were in charge and, you know, and there, wasn't, there wasn't a governor that came through after Brendan Byrne that didn't kowtow to the casinos. They all did. Do you remember how you voted on the casino referendum? I, there were two referendums. Uh, the first year, uh, Ann Martindale and I were the co-chairman of Casinos No Dice, because they wanted to put casinos in, in State. uh, statewide. And uh, uh, we had a five-week campaign, no money, and we beat the hell out of it. I mean, you know, it, was, it, was, it, it resonated. You know, a casino in Somerville didn't sound uh, much to the Somervillians. <laughs> in any case, uh, the second one, I'll never forget, because uh, Hap Farley, who wasn't in the Senate then, uh, came to me and said, we need your vote for what I think I needed a two-thirds vote, and uh, they were one short. And I gave them my vote to get it on the, on the ballot. I did not campaign against the second one because it was Atlantic City. Uh, I didn't campaign for it either, uh, and uh, uh, I didn't vote for it. <laughs> now that you bring up the name of Hap Farley, he's obviously a famous figure in New Jersey politics. So, Starting with him, let's talk about your memories of some of these colorful political figures and bosses that you dealt with. Uh, in your first session, you mentioned a couple, Webster Todd, uh, uh, I, believe, I believe some others, but just I loved Hap Farley. randomly talk about Hap Farley, his I style. I loved him. He was a rascal, <laughs> but he was a wonderful rascal. And uh, <clears throat> he, knew, he knew the process almost better than anyone else. And uh, you couldn't get legislation through the Senate without his approval, period. And uh, when you know that, then you you become uh, 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 you understand uh, what you got to do. And uh, and Hap and I became very uh, matter of fact. The last three testimonials he had before he died, I was a speaker at it. And I mean, I, we we were close. And he did a lot for me. He helped me. He helped me when I wanted to repeat as Senate president, nobody had. Hap was one of those who, who, who made sure he helped me. How was he a rascal? Well, he would do things. Uh, <clears throat> lots of times there were pretty important pieces of legislation that had passed the assembly and nobody could ever find them because Hap had them in his desk. <laughs> <laughs> and he made sure that the ones that he wanted to put away, he put away. And that was it. <laughs> the, the bills just weren't around. But uh, uh, he, uh, as I say, he, he absolutely knew the process. And I'll tell you what he was good at. He was good at making important things happen in the caucus. You know, the, Back in those days, the caucus reigned. And if you had a major piece of legislation, uh, you had to get it through the caucus, the Republican caucus. And Hap had ultimate control of the caucus. But when, whenever a governor had an important program, sooner or later he would surface and usually to help. So he was, he was, a, he was a lot more positive in legislation than a lot of people realize. I mean, important legislation. Uh, but he was... <coughs> He used to have all the senators down to Atlantic City for a weekend, you know, bring your family, you know, and they put us up in those palaces that they, these tired old palaces that were there then. And uh, uh, I never forget it. The first time I went down there, I was, I was first year senator. I took my kids and my wife, and uh, we went in to see Hap, pay our respects when we arrived. and. He went around and he gave each of my kids 50 bucks uh, to play 
whatever they wanted to play along the boardwalk. You know, he was, he, he was, yeah, I'm, I'm saying to myself, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> but but uh, it was for the kids and uh, he was uh, very good at that. He was a, uh, and he was a great advocate. Uh, Stockton State College is there because of Hap Farley. How did he and other leaders of that time, and subsequently you as a legislative leader, get to become leaders and so strong in your leadership, leadership roles, and how has it changed over the years? Well, I think uh, some of the strength of that was, was uh, <coughs> well, there's several factors. Uh, the caucus was important. If you, if you controlled uh, a majority of votes in the caucus, you, you had something to say. Uh, secondly, uh, the governors in those days understood the system and, and helped. Like Bill Cahill had, uh, through Paul Sherwin, had about five senators that if I needed five votes, I had five votes. Uh, so, you know, we worked together on major stuff. Uh, and we did our homework for the most part. And that's important. And how much was the threat of discipline either yeah. Some adverse no. impact. No, no, there wasn't. A, there wasn't a lot of threat of discipline. Uh, you either were, <clears throat> you know, you either made the governor happy, or you made me happy, or you made me unhappy, and made the go. You know, it wasn't a. Uh, you know, there, there's always another day to fight, and uh, so you 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 couldn't take those couldn't take that seriously. Tommy Kane, for example, was a good legislator. And when he became speaker, he had all kinds of troubles with Bill Cahill. And uh, Cahill had troubles with him. And, uh, but they learned, to, they learned to live with each other. Was that more an ideological or a personal conflict? Ideological. Tommy, Tommy started out, at, for example, fundamentally against the sports complex, as did my assemblywoman, Millicent Fenley, who was a conserv conservationist, and uh, she thought we were despoiling the metal ends. <laughs> well, we'll get, we'll get to the metal ends shortly, but uh, any other sort of political figures uh, in addition to Hap Farley you want to reminisce about? Well, there are an awful lot of great guys. Old Bike Littell, uh, Bobby Littell's father was a was a character in the Senate. I mean, he was, he was, and Dick Stout from Monmouth County was a good senator. He got wiped out in the in the uh, Brendan Byrne election. Uh, uh, How was Littell a character? Huh? How was Littell a character? Oh, he was just. Uh, he was from Sussex County, and uh, uh, he was a, he was a bony from Sussex County. I mean, he was a he was. <laughs> I mean, he was just, he's just, uh, uh, you loved him because he was so down to earth. And he'd tell anybody anything. Uh, the, uh, Jimmy Caffaro was always a good, from, from Cape May, was always a good senator. He came after Charlie Sandman. Charlie Sandman was a good legislator. Uh, uh, the, uh, there are a whole bunch of individuals that, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of stood up and stood out. Wayne Dumont was very different, but he was, he, he, he could hold his own with anybody. What about on the Democratic side? Um, how about the sort of uh, Hudson County uh, delegation? Well, yeah, you know, we, we talked earlier about yeah, David yeah, the, Hudson, the Hudson impact was very good, but Eddie Crable was a, was a real powerhouse uh, and loved it. He, he really enjoyed uh, uh, he really enjoyed it. Johnny Lynch was a good legislator, big John, uh, John Sr. Uh, uh, Middlesex and Hudson tend to dominate the, uh, that side of the aisle. Uh, uh, back in those days, uh, uh, most of the, re the senators from Essex were Republicans. Who were the best sort of floor speakers that you recall? Howard Woodson made the two best speeches I ever heard in my life. Uh, having said that, uh, 
certain guys were wonderful to listen to. Bob, uh, 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 Billy Musto. Billy Musto was a character on the floor and pretty damn good, and made made uh, very strong arguments in his own Hudson County way. Uh, and with his Hudson County accent. With his Hudson County accent and his Hudson County mannerisms. He was terrific. Uh, uh, Eddie Crable was straightforward. He wasn't a, he wasn't a dynamo on the floor. Uh, I'm trying to think who else was, uh, was impressive. There were several. Eddie O'Meara was good when he got going. He didn't do it that much, but he, when he did it, he was good. Uh, having said all that, uh, as an aside, last night I went to uh, uh, Candy Strait's mother's viewing, and I saw Bobby Sarcone, who was a senator back then, for the first time in 35 years, I think. Well, how has... Uh the legislature in terms of the people who are serving. Let's start with here. How, how has the sort of type of people who run for the legislature changed? Now you have a son in the yeah, assembly yeah. who's who's running for the Senate. Uh, in there the are a lot of good election. there are a lot of good folks on both sides of the aisle that run for the legislature uh, <clears throat> with a salary up around 50,000 and legislative offices and and a lot of other perks there are a number of people in different areas that are running for the money. Uh, that's different. That, uh, that, you know, when I went in, the salary was $2,500. So <laughs> that's a little bit different. Uh, so uh, money, money has changed the legislative process. And of course, the influx of big time lobbying operations, big money lobbying operations, has changed the legislative process. The lobbyists know more about the bills than the legislators do. Now, you were also one of the advocates for a more professional legislature with more staff. Uh, you've mentioned that some of that derived from Eagleton uh, yeah, programs okay, right and, from Eagleton, right. and advice. Uh, some people have suggested that it's become too much of a bureaucracy mm -hmm. that the legislators themselves are somewhat divorced from the issues. No, I from think their that I think that's true. I think the legislators uh, in the seventies, sixties, and seventies knew more about uh, the fundamentals of basic legislation than they do today, because they got staff that knows everything, and, and they tend to uh, over rely. It's it's kind of the congressionalization of of the legislatures, and it's going on around the country, and we're partially responsible for it. We try to get more professional legislatures, and uh, in doing so, it's gone a little far. And, uh, it's noticeable. They don't know as much. They really don't. And what about the campaign finance uh, pro programs that were initially supposed to be reforms where the legislative leaders were given some exceptions in terms of raising money? Uh, how have they worked out? I'm... I'm uh, that's the Jess Unruh theory of, uh, of, uh, of funding the legislatures, and I'm, uh, I don't think it's worked out. I think that, uh, leadership packs are venal. Uh, they're, there to, they're there to make sure the leaders stay the leaders, and uh, that's not what it should be all about. That's what it is all about. But still in New Jersey, most incumbent legislators get reelected. Um, is really money so much of a factor in local legislative decisions? Not as much as people think. I think money is a, is more an intimidation than anything else. They intimidate people who might run against them. But you still think that the threat of a legislative leaders. Refusal to provide funds for an individual race may have a difference. Yep. Yes, I do. Any other reforms uh, in terms of the legislative 
<laughs> staff for <laughs> committee sessions, committee I've got meetings. A lot, I've got a lot of reforms. Uh, uh, <clears throat> assemblymen should not run every two years. Uh, governors should not run every four years. And I, 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 I've always been for a one six-year governorship, uh, six-year Senate, three-year assembly, and uh, you know, the guy, at least the guy gets four, the governor gets four or five years without having to consider the politics of re-election, even though the politics of re-election will be around. Uh, I've always felt that, uh, you know, our campaigns are too long, too expensive. You know, we, we started campaigns in, in the 1800s uh, because People rode by horseback all over the country to get to see constituents, and it took a long time. You can have a primary in the middle of September, a presidential primary in the middle of September, and the, the folks will be fed up with the issues by November. You know, and yet we're, we're running right now for, for two years. We're going to pump uh, hundreds of millions of dollars into a whole bunch of campaigns, and the public is just going to... Uh, you know, there's no need for it. But can you make changes like that? No. It's impossible. Yeah, I like the British system. I like to be able to call an election 60 days from now and have it. Any other political or governmental reforms that you would think were right at this point? Not a, not a lot. I'm a, <coughs> I'm a strong governor person. Uh, I don't want. I don't want to see a bunch of elections, statewide elections, for for controllers or, or other people. I, I you know, I, uh, I New Jersey's system of a strong governor, a properly operated, uh, is, is what I like. Uh, I just like to see the governor have more time to do what he should do, rather than have to bump in the re-election all the time, every every third year. Another area where you've uh, had a significant influence and role over the years has been the Meadowlands and the Sports Authority. Uh, describe your role in the more recent developments in the Meadowlands and also your sort of ideas of what the Meadowlands uh, would become now when you first uh, started talking about that way back in the 1960s and 70s? Well, you know, the Meadowlands became much more significant in New Jersey than I ever dreamt it would be, that the place would be. I mean, it was just, it was the place for the Final Four, it was a place for uh, six professional teams, it was a place for Bruce Springsteen, it was, you know, it was, it put us on the map worldwide. 200 million people have been there since we started. I mean, it's, it's, it's big time. Uh, about five or six years ago, <clears throat> when Donnie DeFrancesco was governor, short period of time, uh, he proposed an Xanadu-like uh, propo proposal uh, that, uh, 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 for the Meadowlands. And I, I was chairman at the time, and uh, uh, I just thought it was too much. And so I was, in the last six years, I've been opposed. I've been the naysayer all the way through. Uh, uh, the, uh, his project didn't go through, but uh, Exanadu or the Mills project did go through, and it was uh, it, it was and will be a disaster. You know, it's going to be a great big shopping center, a huge shopping center. And you know, Bergen County needs another huge shopping center. Like I need a hole in my head, uh, but uh, so be it. Now I'm worried about uh, what the sports. Uh, 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 Governor Cody uh, uh, pushed and got a, uh, a compromise between the Jets and the Giants to build a new fo football stadium, million, a billion four. It's going to be sensational. But in the process, most of the things that the sports authority has been doing will not do. So we're just going to be, a, you know, sports authority is going to become a, a landlord uh, and not much more, depending upon what happens in two things. Depending upon what happens to the Continental Arena and what happens to uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, whether we can put in slot machines at the racetrack. Because if we don't put in slots at the racetrack, that big, beautiful racetrack that uh, has been pumping money into the economy for 30 years is going to be gone in two years. Gone. Do you see eventual selling off the remaining assets of the sports complex if you can't change the financial structure of the authority? Well, they're going to have to either. Uh, I, I think that I think those are are clear options. Uh, uh, I'm sure there are private groups that would buy the Continental Arena, for example, because it's a good arena and because it, it, uh, 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 it will attract a lot of things that will not go to Newark. Uh, can two arenas live side by each, uh, Newark and, and East Rutherford? I think so. But the only way you're going to find out is to let it happen for three or four years, and at the end of three or four years, I think a governor can make a decision as to whether it makes sense or whether it didn't make sense. Uh, the uh, racetrack's a difficult problem. Uh, it's going to be hard to get slots at our tracks, even though New York has them, Pennsylvania has them, Delaware has them, uh, and they're killing us. Uh, what people don't know right now is that uh, the revenues from the, the horse revenues have carried the complex over the years, they're down to nothing. I mean, they're down to less than $5 million a year, something like that, and start at $50 million a year. I mean, it's bad. I mean, it's, it's much worse than people see. So what's the future? It will always be a great, that stadium, that when they build it, it'll be built by 1910, I think, I mean, 2010. Uh, that stadium will be 40 years a great place. You know, it'll be a great place for Jets, Giants, college football, uh, whatever else they do, you know, Bruce Springsteen, all, all those kinds of things. Uh, so that'll be, a, that'll be a well used facility, but it'll all be run by Giants, Jets. And uh, uh, so there won't be a big role for the sports authority unless Continental Arena and the racetracks stay, stay in business. What type of project would you, if you would you have preferred to Xanadu or other sort of retail-based uh, proposals? Nothing. I would have preferred uh, maybe a baseball stadium there, uh, uh, may, maybe another sports venue or two, a soccer stadium, and now soccer's going to uh, Harrison, and that's good. I mean, I, I don't have any problem with Harrison. When, I, when Christy was governor, uh, my first year as chairman, second year as chairman, I had those people all set to, to uh, build a 25,000 seat uh, soccer stadium right next to Giant Stadium. And uh, they, uh, the, the administration got, got cold feet on the thing and didn't do it. Uh, but now they're going to a good spot. You know, that's where, that's where the soccer fans live. And that should be a successful stadium before it's done. I guess during the early planning for the Meadowlands, there was the idea that it would be more of a community, more balanced with housing, uh, other projects. Uh, there's been some limited housing, but not a lot. Uh, is that a disappointment that it's not become sort of a new city as opposed to these sort of destination not to me. projects? Not to me. I always thought it was a destination kind of a place. and. Uh, <coughs> I'm happy with that, but I'm also in the minority. <laughs> um, has the Meadowlands and the Sports Authority also become a little too politicized in the... Oh, well, George, George Zaffinger, who's done a lot of good things, has, uh, has really made it a... Uh, you know, he's, he has a tendency to, to uh, beat up anybody that gets in his way, and uh, he beat up wonderful people like Wellington Mara, for example. Uh, you know, with no reason to do it. Uh, so he's politicized the place. Uh, uh, but having said that, it's not a political nest by, uh, you know, it never has been. You know, he, he accused it of being, but it wasn't. Never was.
Of course, Brandon Burns sent his chief of staff, Bob Mulcahy, up to the Sports Authority, well, that's, that's, which de departed from the early appointments that yeah, they were but, more professional industry, sports industry yeah, except, people. Uh, yeah, but Mulcahy was a, you know, he was a cabinet member uh, and had a lot of stature in his own right. Uh, but yes, Brandon did do that, and and uh, significantly, uh, Jim Florio and significantly Christy Whitman kept him on. So, you know, he, he did something right. But you don't think that was a mistake to sort of start the no. tradition no. of uh, no. No. Trenton insiders no. going up to the sports authority? Because no. most of the people that, you know, I know I know all the people that work there. Matter of fact, most of them are gone now because they're, they just had an early retirement program. But uh, there are wonderful people that worked there since 1977 and 78 and 80. You know, they're, they're career kind of people. Uh, I wouldn't even begin to guess their politics. Uh, uh, and that, you know, they were great people and they ran events, you know, and the event people will tell you that uh, nobody runs events better than the Meadowlands. I mean, I, I stood there one day before the, uh, oh, who was Navy playing? Navy was playing somebody and uh, it was an Army, it was Army-Navy, Army-Navy game and the, uh, uh, the head guy from the, from Annapolis made about a 15 minute speech about the fact that I don't even need a contract at the Meadowlands. All I got to do is shake Bob Mulcahy's hands and we'll get the finest performance uh, uh, that we would get anywhere in the country, you know. Uh, it, it always ran events well, whether it was the Pope or the Final Four. I mean, they were always well run and it, that's because there was a whole bunch of dedicated people in there that knew what the, what the hell they were doing. Uh, most of those people are gone. And that's another problem. And why is that? Because of the uncertainty of the future in the Meadowlands? Well, because of the uncertainty of the future and because they, they put out a, uh, uh, a kind of nice retirement package. And so the combination of the two things. and. And I think they realize that the Giants and Jets will be running all the affairs in that vent, in that uh, uh, stadium, and uh, so you know they just kind of. Then they're all 60, 65, 68. You know they're people who have worked their lives there, so the place is not well manned at all right now. And of course the governor is faced with picking a new uh, CEO. I've got two or three for him, but I've, I'm afraid to t suggest them because he won't take them. Well, let's not put put it on the record because you probably, if you're wrong, it'll be for <laughs> posterity. Um, let's talk more generally about land use and development in New Jersey uh, since the 1960s or so. Uh, Brendan Byrne made some efforts toward a stronger statewide role in overseeing development that didn't really go very far in the legislature, I believe. Uh, Senator Greenberg introduced a bill, but it didn't get right. out of committee. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, there were a lot of regional approaches, like we've just spoken with the Meadowlands and, uh, and significantly in the Byrne administration with the Pinelands. Uh, earlier than that, the coastal zone really began with Governor Cahill and most recently the Highlands. Uh, yeah, all very important. Uh, initiatives, but that's the that's the only way you're going to get uh, certain things done. Uh, uh, basically, local zoning stinks, uh, and I say that in every sense of the word. Uh, I see it in my town. I get wonderful township committee folks, but they fold up when when the pressures come on and and. Uh, so what's, what's happening to uh, uh, suburban New Jersey is just overdevelopment. Uh, and that, that pretends troubles, especially as taxes go up, but that pretends troubles anyway. And uh, the rural areas are, 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 are have, have seen that pain too. Uh, and, and you know, even everything affects something else. As 
as uh, as horse racing goes down the tube, there's several hundred thousand of acres of horse farms in New Jersey, which will feel the eventually feel the the heat on that one. I mean, no, they'll, they'll still race. They'll race in New York, or they'll race in Delaware, or they'll race in Pennsylvania, and they'll race a little bit in New Jersey, but it isn't the same. And they'll start making decisions about their properties, which uh, uh, which is a big problem. Our Green Acres program has been another initiative that that has been good, but it isn't as big as it uh, as it ever should have been. I mean, it, uh, it it's it's had an effect. If uh, municipalities aren't able to stand up to the pressure put on them for development, and they also have some legal constraints as to exactly what they can do. Uh, what would you suggest as a solution? More power at the county level or the state level? Those aren't good Republican positions. <laughs> I, I think that we've got to do it as we're doing it, only do it better and put more pressure on, on uh, uh, you know, some of the some of local local officials are be getting very good at putting pressure on developers and getting something in return, whether it's protected land or uh, uh, payment per house or whatever. Uh, that, uh, there's a lot of that going on now, and there'll probably be a lot more of it going on. Rather than change the system, we've got to make the system work better. Because the courts have struck down some of those quid pro quos. So yeah. yeah. You, you, you'd support something that gave local governments more authority to fashion those type of packages. Yep. Uh, Ray, before we close, any sort of final thoughts or prescriptions you'd like to no. put on the record for New Jersey or? Uh, no, uh, I still, I still love the place. I just think it's not what it was, and uh, <clears throat> I guess that's true of almost any place you might live in for your whole life. Uh, but I've seen, I've seen my little area change dramatically, and it has good government. It has essentially good people trying to make good decisions, but even the pressures uh, has kind of overwhelmed them, and uh, a lot of it's schools. And I don't see that changing at all. I think you know, I think locally people are going to try to build the best school system they can just irregardless of caps and everything else. And how about looking back now on the state government and the legislature as it operates today compared to your days? I've sent some feeling that the old days may have been a little bit I better. That, I think the days when, especially when Governor Hughes, Governor Cahill, and Governor Byrne uh, were governors, were very, very productive. Uh, uh, 20 years, I mean, very productive, uh, much more so than you see today. Of course, we had money to spend, you know, we, uh, we weren't broke, although we were broke at certain times, but, uh, uh, you know, we could do more with what we had. Uh, and since, uh, since the middle of the 80s, we've kind of been standing still in New Jersey. I think. Although, you know, you can get pretty excited about Hoboken, about Jersey City's waterfront, uh, about a number of places that are, that are, that are really, and, and I, I always, I always thought, and I had a, you know, when I ran for governor, I always said that you can't rebuild cities from the outside. You've got to rebuild them from the inside. And you've got to have people on the inside that uh, have some vision. And uh, where that has happened, uh, some exciting things have happened. Let's close there. Thank you.